On this Thursday night, grief turns to fury in Beirut. Tonight, chants of revolution. As Beirut buries its dead and pleads for the world to help. Allegations about a hit squad, how this former top Saudi intelligence official claims he was being hunted down here in Canada. From death row to a new life. <laughs> the first woman convicted of blasphemy in Pakistan tells us her hopes and fears in her new home in Canada. And a reminder of the horrors of nuclear weapons. Marking 75 years since the world's first nuclear attack. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with stunning allegations from the former top Saudi intelligence chief who now lives in Canada. He claims the crown prince of Saudi Arabia sent a hit squad to track him down and kill him in Canada because he knows too much. The allegations are made in a civil lawsuit filed in the United States. These are allegations. Nothing's been proven in court. Mike LeCouture has been looking through the lawsuit. Mike, take us through this. Well, Donna, this lawsuit was filed today in a U.S. federal court. And while we're not able to verify the allegations in these court documents, they are extraordinary. The suit alleges that Saudi Arabia's crown prince sent a hit squad to Canada on a mission to kill a former top Saudi intelligence officer. His name is Saad El Jabri. He's a permanent resident of Canada who now lives in Toronto. The suit claims that his deep knowledge of the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman's business dealings, make him a target. Now, in this suit, Al Jabri's lawyers allege that a group of elite hitmen known as a Tiger Squad were sent to Canada at the direction of MBS. According to the court documents, this is the same group behind the 2018 killing and dismemberment of journalist Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Now, the suit claims members of that squad were stopped at Pearson International Airport less than two weeks after Khashoggi's death, attempting to enter Canada on tourist visas carrying bags of forensic tools. Now, the plot was allegedly thwarted by Canada border officers. All men were refused entry except for one. Now, he was let in with a diplomatic passport and allegedly met with El Jabri to pursue him, to persuade him rather, to visit family in Turkey. But El Jabri never went. Mike, all of this is stunning. Uh, all these allegations are stunning. What is the Canadian government saying about it all? Well, Public Safety Minister Bill Blair wouldn't comment on the allegations, but he did say, quote, it is completely unacceptable and we will never tolerate foreign actors threatening Canada's national security or the safety of our citizens and residents. Now, relations between Canada and Saudi Arabia have been strained since August of 2018, when then Foreign Affairs Minister Christopher Freeland tweeted that the kingdom should immediately release imprisoned protesters. But clearly, relations weren't frosty enough to stop the two countries from signing the $14 billion deal this April, which will see Canada sell the kingdom light armored vehicles. Donna? All right, Mike LeCouture in Ottawa, thank you. The American president made a surprise announcement today involving Canada. Donald Trump says he's reimposing tariffs on Canadian aluminum and that he signed a proclamation that will put a 10% levy on raw aluminum imports from Canada. Canada was taking advantage of us, as usual, and I signed it, and it imposes because the aluminum business was being decimated by Canada. Very unfair to our jobs and our great aluminum workers. Steel and aluminum tariffs were first imposed on Canada in 2018 and then removed last year as part of the new NAFTA agreement, which took effect in July. Some American metals companies have complained Canadian aluminum has flooded the U.S. market. Shifting now to Beirut, a city broken, a city where the dead are being buried, and anger is rising to the surface. Two days after a powerful explosion flattened whole neighborhoods, a collective effort to clean up the streets turned into a protest. People are fed up with government corruption, furious it appears negligence led to the explosion. Lebanese officials promised to investigate the cause, but few in Beirut seem to trust them. People want new leadership and an international investigation into the blast. 
That's the French President Emmanuel Macron. He was in Beirut today to tour the destruction, and he was met with pleas for the world to help. Macron says he supports an independent probe into the blast, and he warns that without change, Lebanon could run out of food and fuel within months. <laughs> Lebanon has now begun an official period of national mourning. Funerals are taking place for the victims. At least 137 people are now confirmed to have died, and more than 5,000 are injured. There are fears others might be found under the rubble. As Crystal Gamansing reports, there is no way Lebanon can recover from this on its own. They're chanting, we will pay our blood and soul for the sake of Beirut. Powerful words that speak to their renewed determination. Average people are focused on moving forward just days after their world was ripped apart. We cannot keep living in sorrow. We cannot keep living and uh, uh, we cannot keep depressed. We have to think on what to do. Fani Hadros is a Lebanese Canadian. He couldn't believe his eyes after the blast, but he has faith in his people. You know, in Lebanon, like we have, like each each party, each team, each uh, community has their own uh, uh, political views and uh, all this. We all put all of this together, all on our side, and we get united. <laughs> But some are still angry. The Lebanese justice minister was heckled on the street and water bottles tossed at her. The mood much different for the French president. The student asked that he deal with the corruption in Lebanon. Emmanuel Macron is the first foreign leader to visit following the explosion. Lebanon is a former French colony. He told people aid would get to those who need it, and that need is growing. We are now trying to see how we could help the survivors, especially the people that they have lost uh, everything and now they are displaced. The port where the blast originated was one of the busiest in the eastern Mediterranean. Nearly all goods used in Lebanon passed through this site. It was also a hub for Jordan, Syria, Iraq and Persian Gulf states. Some container liners are diverting ships to Lebanon's smaller port in Tripoli to keep supply lines running. Other donated supplies are being flown in. There are reports the Lebanese government has given an investigative committee four days to determine who's responsible for the deadly blast. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. A woman who spent nearly 10 years on death row in Pakistan, accused of blasphemy, has now found safe haven here in Canada and is telling her story to Global News. Her name is Asya Bibi, and what happened to her triggered an international outcry. She's Christian, and she was convicted after a long-standing dispute with neighbors ended with a group of local women accusing her of insulting the Prophet Muhammad. For years, she didn't know if she'd live or die, and then in 2018, Pakistan's Supreme Court granted her freedom. She ended up in Canada. We can't disclose the location because there are still people who want her dead. Asya Bibi is making up for lost time. She's free and in a new home in Canada. Her two youngest daughters were just eight and nine years old when she was arrested in Pakistan. It was 2009. Bibi, a farm worker and Christian, was accused of arguing with local Muslim women over a cup of water. She was dragged away from her family and became the first woman convicted under Pakistan's blasphemy laws. She was sentenced to death. Her case was a lightning rod. Pakistan is mostly Muslim. Less than 2% of people are Christian. Amnesty International has called for the draconian blasphemy laws to be repealed, saying the accused are often presumed to be guilty on the basis of little or no evidence. And those who tried to help Bibi paid with their lives. In 2011, the governor of Pakistan's Punjab province was murdered after seeking a presidential pardon for Bibi. Two months later, a Christian cabinet minister who advocated for changes to blasphemy laws was shot and killed. Lawyer Saif Ul Maluk took on Bibi's case in 2014. 
since 2011, I'm under the police court, along with my family, the armed police officials, the state 24 hours with me, wherever I go. He brought her appeal all the way to Pakistan's Supreme Court, and in 2018, it overturned her conviction. But the joy was fleeting. <laughs> Across the country, there was outrage. Thousands took to the streets. The motorways, the all highways of the country was uh, closed by these mullahs and the religious uh, people, and the country was standstill. They demanded Bibi and the judges be executed. The only way to save her was to get her out of the country. Her lawyer had to flee, too. Quiet negotiations began, and Canada became the safe haven. Asha Bibi, who was persecuted for her faith, is on her way to Canada. She lives a quiet life now with her husband and daughters in an undisclosed location. Cooking, um, cleaning, and um, gardening. No longer a government-sponsored refugee, she admits it's been difficult to make ends meet. She cannot speak English or French and still fears an international assassin could find her. And other lives are at risk too. After Asia Bibi's freedom, our hope is uh, quite boost up, you can say. This man's sister and brother-in-law have also been convicted under Pakistan's blasphemy laws. Shagufta Kausar and Shafak Emanuel have been on death row since 2013. This is how Joseph, who has asked us not to use his last name, describes his sister's state of mind. Very stressed, crying, seeking for help, begging, please, for God's sake, do something to get me out. I can't take it more. I can't take it more. I can't take it more. This was her call. With the help of Bibi's former lawyer, the couple is appealing their conviction. As for Bibi, she's grateful to Canada for her second chance at life and hopes to be an advocate for religious freedom. So, I also have a request that all the Christian community of Christian community should help them. Because there are many problems in Pakistan. So, I want to work for them. So, they will get help. Her three adult children and several grandchildren still live in Pakistan and worry remains her constant companion. Another Canadian has been sentenced to death in China on drug charges. Court documents give few details, but local media are reporting Xu Wei Hong was convicted of making and storing ketamine. In a statement, Global Affairs Canada says it's profoundly concerned by the sentence and that Canada opposes the use of the death penalty in all cases. Canada is seeking clemency. She was the third Canadian China has sentenced to death on drug charges after a deep decline in relations between the two countries. Canadians answering the calls for help. Coming up, how Lebanese Canadians are doing all they can to help those in Beirut left with nothing. Canada is planning to support Lebanon, providing $5 million in federal aid for humanitarian assistance. Lebanese Canadians, meanwhile, continue to look for other ways to help their homeland rebuild. While no formal fundraising event has been launched, people have begun raising money for the Lebanese Red Cross. As Camille Karamali reports, with Lebanon's biggest port destroyed, getting goods into the country is going to be a challenge. This is what remains of an apartment less than a kilometer from the blast site. In every room, mangled metal, destroyed furniture, broken glass. Just that feeling, that, that gut-wrenching feeling. The home belongs to Canadian Jad El Tal's mother. He called her minutes after the explosion happened. The minute she answered, I just hear like screaming and I'm like, are you okay, are you okay? And then she just said, we're okay, we're okay, what happened, what happened? The deadly blast hits home for thousands of Lebanese Canadians halfway around the world. The need is immediate and anything we can do, anything anybody can do, uh, will be great. 
As soon as Joe Hamadi heard about the fatal blast, he kicked off a fundraising campaign, vowing to match every dollar raised. Less than 24 hours after launch, it had collected more than $100,000, going towards the Lebanese Red Cross. So what does this say about the Lebanese-Canadian community here? You know what? We never expected this. But like I said, people are um, very generous. The community is rallying across the country, including $12,000 raised by the Lebanese Club of Ottawa. Well, it made me proud to be part of this country and to be Canadian. The need for goods is dire. We need anything in Lebanon right now. And the list is long. Food, equipment, medical equipment, uh, just name it. I have a big list. But now a major hurdle. The Honorary Consulate of Lebanon in Toronto has been trying to find ways to transport donated goods to Beirut. But with the country's biggest port now looking like a war zone, the options are limited. See if we can get help to airlift them or uh, get like with a boat. And we have a few other ports that smaller size. Hopefully they will accommodate uh, those boats. And hope is all anyone can hold on to while the country tries to get back on its feet. Camille Karamali, Global News. Still ahead, a big announcement from Nova Scotia's Premier. Watching Global National. The Premier of Nova Scotia surprised everyone today. Stephen McNeil announced he's stepping down. He says the job has taken its toll on him. This year alone, the province suffered several tragedies, including deaths linked to COVID 19 and Canada's deadliest mass shooting. As Alexa McLean reports, a public inquiry is taking place into that, and McNeil's government could face criticism. Canada's longest-serving premier says he's been in the job long enough. First elected in 2003, Stephen McNeil has been Nova Scotia's premier since 2013, leading two liberal majority governments. 17 years is a long time. I love this job. I've enjoyed every day of it. And every day I'm inspired by the people of this province. But this is not a lifelong career. His resignation comes as a surprise to many, but McNeil says it's something he says he's been contemplating for some time. In a prepared speech, McNeil thanked Nova Scotians for sticking together during a tumultuous year. Through the deaths and hardships brought on by COVID-19 and the grief and pain caused by April's mass killings that took the lives of 22 innocent people. McNeil says Nova Scotians have shown faith in each other. Our province has experienced one tragedy after another, and we've seen a lot of death. Families have suffered immeasurable loss, and it is my hope that the generosity of others and the support from fellow Nova Scotians will continue to help heal broken hearts. The scrutiny is expected to be placed on the police and government response to the April killings in an upcoming public inquiry. McNeil has said he's committed to its search for answers. McNeil says he doesn't know what he'll do after leaving public office. He'll continue to lead the province until the Nova Scotia Liberals hold an election race and elect his successor. The party has until 2022 to hold a provincial election. Alexa McLean, Global News, Halifax. The horrors of nuclear war up next, lessons from the attack on Hiroshima. This photo, this mushroom cloud, is as menacing today as it was 75 years ago. It was taken about an hour after the Enola Gay dropped a nuclear bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The world had never seen anything as horribly, powerfully destructive. At least 70,000 people were killed immediately, just their shadows left behind. That was August 6, 1945. Another 70,000 people died in the weeks after from radiation exposure, cancer, and other long-term effects killed tens of thousands more. Three days later, the U.S. dropped a second nuclear bomb on Nagasaki. As Eric Sorensen explains, it's still a searing, a cautionary tale about the horrors of nuclear war. The bell tolls and the sound lingers, compelling reflection on the horror of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Attendance at this year's somber ceremony limited by COVID-19 
and because there are fewer survivors 75 years on. Terumi Tanaka recalls the white blast at Nagasaki. He was 13. The all-shattering devastation in which was born the atomic age. Tanaka remembers the dead, the destruction, and the suffering from radiation that would go on for years. He spent a lifetime speaking out against nuclear weapons. Activism must continue, says Tanaka, on a treaty to destroy and ban the world's nuclear arsenal. Generations of nuclear nations have avoided the consequences of mutually assured destruction. But among nine countries, there remain more than 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Each one of them is far, far more sophisticated, destructive than those two crude, primitive ones used on my city. Setsuko Thurlow's city was Hiroshima. She is Japanese-Canadian and an outspoken survivor. She's campaigned for greater awareness of Canada's crucial role in uranium mining and research that was part of the Manhattan Project that built the first atom bomb in the Second World War. In the Globe and Mail this week, Thurlow called on the Prime Minister to issue a public expression of regret for Canada's role in the development of nuclear weapons. Three years ago, Thurlow accepted the Nobel Prize for Peace on behalf of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Hers, a strong voice among a shrinking number of survivors. It's a lonely feeling. We have to support each other to survive in this world today. Thurlow's home, Hiroshima, was annihilated. A prediction at the time was that nothing would grow in Hiroshima for 75 years. In fact, a city vibrant and hopeful has risen from the utter destruction. The mayor of Hiroshima today called his community a symbol of peace and an enduring reminder of a painful experience that must never be allowed to repeat itself. Eric Sorensen, Global News. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Orkney Viewpoint in Knee Hill County, Alberta. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.